Good evening, Saints. I want to thank everyone for listening to another Thursday night Bible study and tuning in to another Thursday night Bible study. We are going over the doctrine of who God has called us to be in Christ. And we are looking at Romans chapter 15, and this is the Romans, this is the review. This is the review. And um, this is the uh, uh, the last part of the review here that we're gonna we're gonna be looking at before we get into the um, Romans 16, and we're looking at those things which pertain to God, those things which pertain to God, and many will say, well, didn't we go over the things that pertain to God? But what what we what we have to do, and I've said this before. We have to make sure we have a full we, we have fully under our belt all the things that that Paul is bringing forth here in the Rome in Romans 14, uh, 15 and all the things he went through uh, went over in Romans chapter 15, uh, 14 as well. And that's why he goes over some of the doctrines over there in Romans 14 about being like minded that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God and that and, and all those things, those exhortations that he's giving on to them. He's admonishing them. And when you admonish someone, and we're going to look at that word admonish, because um, we, we kind of grazed over that in a sense, but what we see Paul doing for all of his epistles is edifying and admonishing the saints. When you admonish someone, you, you, you lightly warn them, so to speak. You know, I, I, We'll get into that in a second when we get to those verses there. Uh, but we're getting ready to get to the point, as I said before, where we're nearing the Romans 16 chapter there, where Paul starts to, 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 to talk about all those co-laborers that co-labored. He calls them different names, co-laborers, fellow helpers. Um, he's, he calls some secours. We'll, we'll, go, we'll go over all those words. Um, but what he's, he's explaining, these these are helpers with the ministry. These are co-laborers with me with the ministry. But then he also says, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary. In other words, mark those contrary teachers. You know, not just avoid them, but to, in order to mark them, you had to admonish them at one point. Or you had to understand that these are ones teaching a contrary doctrine. And again, we'll get to that when we get as we move and progress through Romans chapter 16. But let's let's get on with the verses here. We, we left off at Romans uh, 15 verse 14 last time there. But let's look at, let's get into it a little more here. Um, look at verse um, Romans 15. Let's take a look at verse 14. Romans 15 verse 14. And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to admonish one another. Okay, and I'm gonna just stop there. And again, we when we looked at this, we we looked at it in a sense about the idea of uh, that that we ought to be filled with knowledge and full of goodness and the selfless love of God. We we looked at that. And that they, and if they ought to be strong in the faith because they're, they're supposed to admonish. We, we looked at that there. But what we're looking at here is your inward man ought to be full. It ought to be filled and most importantly, able. And, and what is it filled and full and able of? Godliness. It ought to be filled and full and able with God-likeness. That's the point here. Having the spiritual mind, which is according to Christ Jesus. As you, at, we, We've seen that over there in, um, you don't have to turn there, but just over, over in verse 5 there. When you look at verse 5, when Paul says, now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Jesus Christ. According to Christ Jesus. Now, your mind ought to be according to his mind. And that's how you can, in verse 6, with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, that's the problem, folks. Too many people are trying to say they go around, that they, they're glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father, but they're doing it their own way. Or they're doing it the way this world tells them to do it. 
This world will tell them to admonish him in this way. Or, well, you, you, uh, you want to go do it that way. This is the way we do it. And then we assume that this is God's way, even though we didn't read it for ourselves. But that you be able to, that you're able, notice, also able also to admonish. And that is to edify one another. And of course, this is all according to the way Christ Jesus would do it. Now, the question is, well, why does Paul say that we ought to be able to admonish one another? See, as I said at the outset, the word admonish means to gently warn doctrinally. Or, or this is what the OED says, the Old English uh, says, dictionary says, uh, notify of a fault, you know, which doctrinally notify of a fault, reprove my mildly of a fault or what, what they're doing uh, doctrinally. I'm not talking about if they're if, if we see that they're about to vote Democrat or Republican and we go to them and say, hey, you do know that the Republicans believe this or the Democrats believe. No, no, not not that. We're going to get into that later. Or it, it, the other definition of it is to counsel against wrong practices, okay, or to caution or advise doctrinally, spirit, according to the spirit, according to God's word. To admonish a saint, you would ought to be a huge part of the ministry. That's a huge part of the ministry that we often do not fully understand and appreciate. But that's what we see Paul doing for all of his epistles, edifying and admonishing the saints uh, to be uh, doctrinally this type of saint or to not to be that type of saint. That's what we see him doing. But let, let's take a look at verse 15. Um, verse 15. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God. What? Putting you in mind? What type of mind? Paul's desire is to put the saints in the mind of Christ, folks. That's Paul's desire. He wants to put them in that type of mind, in the mind of Christ, according to those things which pertain to God. We're going to get to that in verse 17. According to those things which pertain to God, those are the things that he's, he's putting them in mind of. And not, not those things which pertain to this world. See, that's where we got to draw that great divide at. Uh, um, uh, turn your Bibles to Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 2. But the one thing we don't want to do is assume the things that we assume is the great things of this world, that God, God is also lined up according to our uh, way of thinking towards those things. And again, when we see Paul says, putting you in mind, look at Philippians 2, verse 2. Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded. Doesn't that remind you of, of, of Romans 15, verse, uh, verse 5? Well, it should. That ye be like-minded, having the same love. Why doesn't he just say, say um, you know, like-minded and, and and being one or being unified or, or, or he's, he's using this, the same love, because the, the like, the mind he wants you to have is the mind of Christ. He wants you to have the same love of Christ. He wants you to be of one accord with Christ. He wants you to be of one mind according to Christ Jesus. And that's what you see here, having the same love as Christ Jesus. Having being of one accord as in accordance to Christ Jesus, meaning do it the way he would do it. And I'm not, that's, this is not the thing where people will say, what would Jesus do? This is not that. And of one mind, the mind of Christ. Um, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Folks, this here is 
selflessness. That's what this is all about. Selfless love. You, you don't think so? Verse 2 says having the same love. And what do you think this lowliness of mind is? You think it's charity? No, it's not. This is not, this is, this is not charity. This is selfless love. Because that's the selfless love Christ had. Uh, look, look at look at um, verse three again. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Vain glory is for yourself, self, self, selfishness. Okay, and you you'll be striving. There'll be strife because someone's not going according to your way or your will or your want or desire or your law. You'll say. Why is that person doing it? Because you can't fathom it because it goes against your way. Look at uh, uh, the rest of verse 3. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. And that's when that says let each esteem other, that's not just saying everyone uh, esteem everyone else better than themselves. No, that's each one. Let each one esteem other better than themselves so that that's with each and every every saint you you to you to deal with them in that in that godliness and based upon and judging based upon the judgment of what you're dealing with at that moment there you're to esteem them better than you would esteem yourself and, and look at verse four look not every man on his own things but every man also on the things of others and that's not saying don't be nosy or anything. That's saying, look, don't always have so much care for your own things. But also on the things of others. Put you, Your care ought to be not for, for self. It ought to be for others. Let this mind be in you. See, that's the mind you, he's explaining to you from, from, from all those verses there, all the way to that, this point here. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. That's the mind that, that we are beseeched to have. That is what we're going to be doing um, for the rest of our lives and, and even our life eternal, uh, everlasting lives. That's what we're going to be doing. We are going to be operate, operating upon one accord. We're going to be operating upon I mean, with one mind. And we're going to have that the mind of Christ, of course. And it's going to be the same love as we've seen over there in Philippians uh, chapter 2. It's going to be that same selflessness. It's, it's, a, it, it, it's, it's a likeness. This is an identity. Like when we went through Romans, when, as we're going through Romans 15, when we started out in Romans 15, when I said that it was a, an identity, this is an identity as, a, as one that is strong in the faith, one that is a, a Bible minister, one that is a, or a Bible teacher or, or whatever you want to use, <laughs> name you want to use, but one that's going to be edifying others, one that is strong in the faith. That's the way God's word, God designed his word to operate within us, and he designed it to work uh, through us and, 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 and for the benefit of the other saints. Now, Let's move on here. Come over, come down to verse 16. Verse 16. Uh, Romans 15, sorry. Romans 15. Let's look at verse 16. Romans 15, verse 16. That I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. That, oh, well, ministering the gospel of God that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Um, I have therefore whereof may I, that I may glory through Christ Jesus in those things which pertain to God. Now, I want you to want to spend well, not too much time, but the things that pertain to God. See, that's where our mind ought to be. We ought to be able to distinguish and discern now we ought to be <laughs> what pertains to God and what pertains to this world. Okay, folks. Now, the way this world operates with today's church and today's systems, we think and assume 
that those things can pertain to God. But we're taught to glory. And, and, and looking at this here, when Paul says in verse um, verse 17, I, ha I have there for whereof I may glory through Christ Jesus in those things which pertain to God. We are taught to glory through Christ Jesus in those things which pertain to God. But we first have to understand what are those things which pertain to God. Now, if we don't if we don't fully understand the things which pertain to God, we will not fully understand the things which pertain to Satan. And I know you ought to know that. We will think that the world's government, the world system, America, our affairs, or the ones that's listening, others that's listening, uh, um, wherever you live, <laughs> our affairs will think that all those things pertain to God. So when something or someone attacks those things, we think that it's evil. We think that's the evil and that's what the adversary is doing today when actually what we've done, we've created a vain uh, worship or as we've seen over there, vain glory. Remember what he says here, I have whereof I may glory in those things which, through Christ Jesus, the things which pertain to God. We could end up having a vain glory about uh, these things that I just made, that I made mention there. And, and what we'll end up doing is we'll end up walking according to a mind and a spirit which is of this world. If you don't think that that's the case, I'll tell you what you do. How would you feel when the right, how do you feel when the right or the wrong person is in office as a president? Does it stir your heart one way or the other? How, does, how do you feel if the government passes a new law or keeps the law the same? See, it should not have an effect on your mind. That's the issue here, folks. That's the issue. It should not affect your mind. But I heard people saying all the time, oh, I believe in God and country. But see, that's th those, two, those two are contrary to one another. Remember, God's country is in heaven. It's in the third heaven. And it's going to be over there in Zion. Right? But that's where our minds ought to be as well. That's why you see when it says... Um, uh, 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 we, that's why it's, when it talks about looking at not the things which are seen, but the things which are uh, not seen. And, and we're going to look at that in a second. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. Because that's what you ought to look to. You're, you're supposed to look through these things, folks. You're, you're supposed to look through the government. You're supposed to look right through the government. And what I mean by I'm not saying that, oh, I can uh, I look right through what they're doing. I don't mean in that way. I'm, what I mean is that you know they're there. You know it's there. You know this way of this world is is going is taking place, but you're to keep your eyes on the prize or, or on on what you can't see. We'll get to those verses in a second, but it shouldn't stir your heart. And, and well, well, just let, let's read um, uh, verse eighteen. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things. Notice this. Any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed? Well, if Paul says he will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by him, why should we? Why should not? Why? <laughs> I mean, think about this. We should not speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by Paul either. The name Joe Biden should not stir up your heart to anger or motivation. The name Donald Trump should not stir up your heart to anger or motivation. The names that ought to stir your heart up to motivation or anger is our father and Satan. Those are the names that you ought to, that ought to stir up your heart with motivation or anger. And, and of course, we ought to have a burning desire to love what our fathers loves and be of the same mind toward the things he hates. We ought to have the same hatred for the things 
that Satan and this world loves. The world affairs that we see going around us is not the things which which uh, which Christ has wrought by Paul. I don't care who I don't care who the, the preacher said uh, uh, what he said. The world affairs, and what I mean by world affairs is the things you see these uh, preachers of today get involved in, whether it's civil rights, whether it's whether it's the abortion thing, whether it's the all those different affairs that. And people say, "Wait a minute, brother! You saying that's not? Uh, you you saying that uh, that's that that's not wicked?" Well, how do you think your father feels about that? I'm not talking about the way you think he thinks about. It. I'm talking about the way his 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 the word says. I'm talking about what we are, what we see. And again, you got you have to go back to the Lord's day and the apostles' day when they were on the earth. Remember. You had the Roman Empire invading Rome. They were in Rome, set up their government in Rome. You had Satan's men, the Pharisees and Sadducees, sitting in that seat over there. You didn't see them write back about that. All they did was talk about the bad doctrine. They weren't saying, uh, let's, let's overthrow them. They knew that that was, as, as the Lord says, this is your hour and the power of darkness. They were, Satan is the God of the world and they are his ministers. And, and we're to edify, teach, admonish. And this ought to be, but again, we ought to have a burning desire to love what our father loves in the same mind toward the things he hates. We ought to. Look at, we ought to hate the same, that have a hatred for the things that Satan in this world loves. The world affairs that you see is not the things of Christ, folks. It's not what, what uh, the Lord wrought by Paul or worked by Paul. Paul is not going to speak of the affairs of this life um, that will eventually pass away when we pass away. But come, <laughs> come over to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Let's take a look at chapter 4. And we're going to look at what those things are that we that, that Paul is saying. Well, Paul says, I will not dare to speak of any of those things in which Christ have not wrought by me. And again, we, we seem to think that Paul is only talking about bad things or um, hating on someone... Uh, 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 speaking bad about them, you know, that type thing, you know, just things that we assume in our mind based upon our spirit of this world mind. Look at verse 15, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 15. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Notice where it's when Paul says, for all things are for your sakes, these are the spiritual things of Christ. When he says all things, he's talking about sufferings are, is in there too. That's, what he, that, that's the context. Sufferings is the context. And what he may mention in that suffering, matter of fact, you don't have, well, you're already there, so I don't have to say you don't have to turn there. <laughs> but look at what he says here uh, in verse... Um, Verse, look at verse, well, that's too much. It's not too much to go into, but from verses 7 uh, to this point, he's talking about the earthen treasure, the treasure that we have in earthen vessels, and that the excellency, the power may be of God and not of us in verse 7. And he makes mention about all that suffering. The sufferings of Christ is what he makes mention. And let's just read on down. Um, those are the things that he says is for your sakes. And it's the word of God, how the word of God is going to work effectually. And when he says certain things like in verse um, uh, verse 8, trouble on every side, yet not, dis not distressed. Well, being not distressed is for your sakes. Uh, we are perplexed in verse 8, but not in despair. Being not in despair is for your sakes. But it's the word of God that's working effectually within you in your earthen vessel that is going to produce something for your sakes when you suffer. 
When you are going through the sufferings of Christ, remember 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse, actually, that, the whole chapter is, is dedicated it, to sufferings of Christ, and it tells you you have suffering, salvation from your sufferings. He's delivering you from your sufferings, but it's the word that's doing it. The God of all comfort is the one that is operating to do that. And I don't mean it. I'm talking about if you allow it, if you, as you read it and understand it, allow it to work in you, it will work in you. Look at what, um, and that is to your glory for your sakes and also to the glory of God, because you're going to, you ought to give thanks. You ought to, based upon the benefit that you receive from his word. Look at verse 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. See, this right here is doctrine that we ought to have learned in Romans chapter 6. This is doctrine that we are actually Romans, Romans 5. This is doctrine that you ought to have learned in Romans 5 uh, about what where God's affection is at and where your affection ought to be at. Because you understand what he has done for your inward man and, and, and what he's given you, you ought to know where his love is shown. You also ought to know that your outward man is perishing. Not that he's going to uh, uh, come come and, and, and keep on healing it until until you until he calls you home. That's not the way he's operating today, but that's the way this world says he's operating. That he's, he's, um, you know, just showing his power by healing you. But as you see in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, where the excellency of the power is made known with your inward man. But you, this here ought to show you here what is renewed day by day, where your affection ought to be. Look at verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment. Now, how can Paul say our light affliction when he's going to say in uh, chapters, um, well, well, actually, uh, mostly in chapter 11, how much sufferings he went through that no other man went through. But he says, for our light affliction is but for a moment worketh, notice, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. How can that work? How can, when we suffer, how can that work for us? Do you know there's eternal weight and glory in that? No, it is if you're not looking at the things which are seen. But if you're always looking at the things which are seen, that there's no glory. There's no eternal weight in that. Not for God and not for you. I'm not saying that you're not going to get glory in heavenly places. I am saying that when you use his word for the designed purpose that he purposed that you use it, there's glory in that. Look at verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, and the things which are not seen are eternal. Now that should be um, plain and simple, but when you notice he says, while we look not at the things which are seen. And that's what uh, the whole reason why we were going to this is because, now you can turn back over to Romans 15. The reason why is because when Paul says, for I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ have not wrought by me. Well, the things that Paul would speak of are things which you can see. Okay? All the things, folks, everything you can see Every single thing that you can see in this world, Christ did not rock or work that by Paul. Those are not this, those are not spirit. That's not spiritual. The only thing we can see that is that is of a spiritual nature is a f physical book, which of course it's made, it's it's of carnal substance, but the words within it is of, of a spiritual nature. And we ourselves ought to look through everything else in this life. Whatever comes our way, it ought to be discerning it based upon love, that according to Christ Jesus. Being of one accord according to Christ Jesus. 
all those things that he may mention in Romans 15. The like-mindedness, one mouth. And that's not just only on Sunday or Wednesday at 7 o'clock when you go, when, when people go to the church building. Not just only that time that we, we, we speak the same thing, but that we, we be renewed daily and we put this on and we walk in that on a daily basis and not walk based upon what we see. And when we do see this stuff, if you do flip through the channels, and pretty soon you'll get to the point where you start to have a disdain for those things. You start to abhor that. You start to watch TV less. You start to say, well, I'm just not motivated to watch that anymore. But what's going to drive you to say that is the word. Because you ought to be, instead of clicking through the channels, flipping through the pages and reading the verses with spiritual mind, with the spiritual mind. And, and I see too, most too often, many people will be Bible readers. But if you're reading the Bible with a carnal uh, understanding of thinking, and this is for those that's been that's been reading God's word for 60 years, if your thinking is some of the things I mentioned before, just say for instance, if you think, "Well, oh, there's nothing wrong with uh, a preacher being a civil rights activist. There's nothing wrong with a preacher going out there and holding up a sign against abortion or for abortion or." Um, Whatever, whatever the civil things of this world is, um, then you are thinking carnal as well. Because the reason why I say that is this world, remember the Catholic Church does that. Remember the apostolic and the rest of them, they, they do those things. But, you know, you got to remember, we are, our concern ought to be for the things of this world. I mean, for, for the things of God's word, not the things of this world. And whether it's the vaccine, and I, and I hate even bringing the issue up, but that's running rampant today in the church world. And we know what's going on with the, with, with the world itself. Should I or shouldn't I? What should I do? Do you have to wonder? What, what, what does God's word tell you to do? You ought to be edified in his word. That has nothing to do with, with, with bringing honor and glory unto him or being able to be full of goodness, able to admonish one another or anything else. But you, you ought to judge that with a, with a mind where you ought to know what you ought to do. And whether you're saying, well, I'm going to make sure I'm going to do something, of course, whether it's in a healthy way to, uh, for, your, for your health, sake, you know, you're going to say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. That's a sonship decision that you ought to make on your own based upon what his, what, what his word says, not based upon your heart getting stirred up by this world for yea or nay. You ought not get wrapped up in those things, but let's move on. Come over to verse 19. Look at verse 19. Romans 15, verse 19. Through mighty signs and wonders by the power of, of the Spirit of God, so that round about, so that from Jerusalem, round about to I kill him, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Uh, let me just stop there for a second there. Um, Paul says, um, uh, he's preached through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. You know, he's talking about to the unsaved Jew. He went, he went to the unsaved Jew first, and then he went to the unsaved Gentile with the gospel of justification unto eternal life. Then he established the saints. Okay, look at verse 20. Yea, so I have strived to preach the gospel, uh, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But it, is, but it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. Now, notice he's saying, to whom, but as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, in other words, 
to whom Christ was not spoken of, they shall see. And they that have not heard of Christ shall understand. But when he makes mention about to whom, but as it is written, that, that was spoken of at the time. It was talking about uh, um, the, the Redeemer. Well, Christ, we, we know. I, I know you get that. Um, but that they shall understand. Look at verse 22. For the which cause I also have been much hindered from coming unto you. Paul says for the which cause. In other words, for that cause, he has been much hindered from coming unto them. Now, what do you think he means by that? What do you think he means by, for the which cause, um, I have been much hindered coming on to you? Well, think about this. He's, um, he's saying that it, Satan, it was Satan's goal to hinder that from taking place. So that the Gentiles, to whom he was not spoken of, wouldn't hear the gospel. And that they that would see would be established that that was the point he it was satan's goal to to hinder it to stop it from taking place and i mean that that should be again fully um fully understandable there but again he was being hindered from going into those parts um look at um verse 23 verse 23 but now having no more place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come on to you. See, Paul is saying, when he says, but not having no more place in these parts, he's talking about place or purpose by the will of God, either, you know, in those parts. And the reason why he says he has no more place in those parts is because either Paul already had justified and established those saints in those other parts, or he left behind faithful men to do the work of the ministry in those other parts that he says, uh, I have no more place in those parts. <clears throat> well, he says these parts. Um, but he left those faithful uh, ones that's going to do the work of the ministry in those parts. Um, and he's going to ask those saints that, uh, to continue in that and be educated by those saints. Now look at, um, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, verse 23, come to verse 24, we have verse 24, whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey and be brought on my way thitherward by you, if first I be somewhat filled with your company. Now, what he's saying here, he's saying he's going to come on to them, but he's saying, um, for I trust to see see you in my journey and to be brought on my way thitherward by you. So, yeah, and I know you get that there as well. Um, if if I first if first I be somewhat filled with your with your company, verse twenty five. But now I go into Jerusalem to minister unto the unto the saints. And Paul ministering unto the saints. We look at that before we know Paul's not going to go teach uh, the, the, the little flock. That's not why he's going to Jerusalem to, to educate them. He's minist administering onto them carnal things of the Gentiles. But what he's doing, he's doing what he promised. And he gave a, a right hand of fellowship onto Peter with um, over in Galatians chapter 2. Um, you can just hold your place here and... Yeah, hold your place in, in Romans 15. Come over to uh, Galatians chapter 2. And look at verse um, look at verse 9. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, received that the received the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should we should go to the heathen and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. You notice that there? You can go back to Romans 15. But Paul says that I also was forward to do. In other words, well, they wanted to do it. And Paul was Paul was right, signing along right up with it. They were like-minded according to that. 
And they, they had the same way of thinking, that you have poor saints at Jerusalem, but yet you had Gentiles that had the carnal thing. See, that right there ought to tell you, you know, when people people uh, talk about this is written to the Gentile, the Jews only, and, and we've, we've talked with some, um, I've talked with, with the one brother, uh, Brother Leroy Reed, who made mention about that this is written to, to, to Israel. Um, and that they take the Acts 28 position. Well, why do you see one group of saints that have and the other groups of group of saints that don't have? What is God? Uh, God doesn't love the saints in Jerusalem. Why do these saints have but those don't have? Why aren't the Gentiles selling all their possession if if the middle wall was not broken down? You have to think that as well. The middle wall had been broken down as we've seen when, when that took place there, it was not Acts uh, chapter 28. And it wasn't at the cross either, folks. Um, but look at um, verse, verse 26. Verse 26. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. Remember, it pleased it pleased Paul and it pleased the uh, the other apostles too. You know, they, they, remember remember the word the word they used was uh, verse two. It says that the same uh, only that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. <laughs> but here it pleased them of Macedonia and Chia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. Verse. 27, it hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. And see, this is why we have to, I, I thought it right to do this do this here when Paul makes, when Paul says um, about the things which pertain to God. Because if you don't understand the things which are pertain, which pertain to God, you're not going to know what the spiritual things or the carnal. You're not going to know the difference between the spiritual things and the carnal things. You're going to assume when it says, if you're reading this with the carnal mind, you're going to say, the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things. Huh. Wow. So we we get the gift of this. We get we get everything that 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 we see God do with Israel. We're made partakers of those things. But see, that would be with a carnal mind. Because those things you see that we, people talk about the healing and the everything else, that's of a physical nature. But they'll say, wait a minute, but it's coming from a spiritual. So it's a spiritual, it's a spiritual healing I'm asking for. No, but it's, it's going to affect your carnal. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be if God was to pour out um, coins or, or, or money everywhere? Even though it's a spiritual aspect, it would be carnal. If you don't think that's the case, remember over in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, when it talks about uh, they, they ate of the spiritual meat. They did eat the same spiritual meat, but it was actually a carnal. But see, this wouldn't be the same thing with, with, with a healing, even because the men that are doing it the people that are performing it are carnal. They are men. It's not direct from God to you, I mean, to the person. And we, and the reason why I say that is because people, everyone knows that when, that when the person that had the gift of healing, he performed it on someone else. The gift of healing wasn't a person just, just standing there and asking for it, and then it, it just came on them. Yeah, you don't find that. You'll either find God having a favor, having favor on a saint and then performing that. But this here, when it talks about the gifts that people assume that they have or can work, as you see here, this is not talking about that. And I don't know how I got on that, but I'm trying to draw an understanding of the spiritual things and the carnal things. And when it says in verse 27, uh, it hath pleased them verily. You notice where their heart is? They're, they're operating upon selflessness. It pleased them to give. 
And we think today we'll ple we'll when we give um on these assigned days that we assume that that's this that's this here, and it's not. Yeah, there wasn't no there wasn't no uh, uh, January twenty fourth or whatever that they had that they that they're always given annually, because then that wouldn't be love. That would be based upon um, man's man's good man's way of saying this is when you give during this time of year. This is a different type of, of giving here, folks. And they know what their spiritual things are in verse 27. They also know what their carnal things are. They know that giving money or whether it's clothing, whatever those saints need in, needed in Jerusalem, they gave onto them so they can um, minister. They're ministering as well onto those saints. But we, we think that money is a blessing from God, we think that health, wealth, relationship, house, cars, all those things are blessings from God. That's not the case. These saints here understand the difference between spiritual things and the carnal things. They have the like-minded thinking of Christ concerning their ways. Uh, um, they're operating upon a selflessness toward the saints, uh, just as the Lord would do. Just as the Lord would do, that's how they're doing it. Notice they're acting as sons. They know this is right and good in the father's sight. They're doing it like father, like son. They know because he would do the exact same thing. And that's that's the purpose there. They knew they knew that the father would do the exact same thing. They knew that the Lord, if he was on the earth there at that time, that he himself would say it, it would please it pleases me that they would be giving to these poor saints which are at Jeru Jerusalem. And why were they poor? Because their kingdom did not come in. And it's based upon what the nation, what the nation did in blasphemy in the Holy Ghost. They blasphemed and God suspended his program with Israel and he raised up a new apostle Paul to be the apostle of the Gentiles. And that's what we have and what we see in the 13 epistles written unto us, which are not to be rightly divided from each other, as some do, as I made mention. You got some saying, well, the pre-prison epistles apply to us, but the pre but the prison, well, you know what I mean. You're not to, eat. dividing that, that just goes to show again, carnal-minded thinking. It's carnal-minded teaching to, to assume that this is talking to Israel because they can't handle the meat of what's being explained there. When Paul says certain things in the book of Romans or, or, or first and second Corinthians or the pre-prison epistles or the book of Acts, you have pastors that can't handle the doctrine of what's being said. They can't discern what's being talked about there because they lack certain foundational truths. So then when they come, they bring what they learned in their denominations and they bring that here, they bring that uh, uh, to their understanding, they're going to build upon something corrupt. And they're going to assume, oh, this must be talking about that Israel is, this is talking Israel. Now it makes sense. But then they find themselves scratching their heads because it ends up it not making any sense when they get into the verses. But we're looking at the whole issues here of the things that pertain to God is where your mind ought to be in. The mind of Christ is what you ought to have when it comes to judging the things of this world versus the things which are of God, the spiritual things. And understanding when you see those things that are of this world and carnal and all those things you see on TV and, and, and social media, you have to discern that 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 God has no part in place in those things. He's not. That's not what he's doing. He doesn't uh, uh, wink at one one um, one candidate or the other. He's not. He doesn't think it's a great or good thing if this one's in there or that one's in the office. I and mean, people say, "Well, what does he mean when he says pray for them which are in authority?" Well, that has nothing to do with that. He, that, that 
as far as where your heart is. You you ought to know them that are in authority, whether it's in this country or, or any other country. That you ought to have the same um, prayer that 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 about the that, uh, living a quiet and peaceful life. You ought to know that that your mind ought to be of a spiritual mind, the same mind, one accord. Um, but let's let, let's finish up. Let's move on here. I'm looking at the time here. Let, let's let's go to um, verse 28. Verse 28, when therefore I have performed, notice this here, when therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. And I'm sure that when I come unto you, I shall come into the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now, when Paul says he's sure of that, Paul knew that by the time he got to Jerusalem, he was going to come into the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. He's not, he wasn't guessing. He knew it based upon what he was told by the Lord. That's how he can be sure of that. He knew he, he knew he wasn't, he didn't, this wasn't all of the revelation given unto him. But look at verse 30. But now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the spirit that you strive together with me in your Prayers to God for me. Now, we spent quite a bit of, we don't have to spend too much time on this because we spent quite a bit of time on these verses from verse uh, 30 on down verse 33. And we saw that when Paul says, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that this is the selflessness that he's beseeching those brethren. He's saying, I beseech you, brethren, for for your selfless love that you that you've learned from Christ, from the your Father's word, I beseech you for, for that, by that, and for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and that you, you, you have a selfless thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ and his sake, what, what his heart desires. You ought to have a, have a selfless thinking concerning what he desires. What would he desire of you? Does he? What does he think is good? What does he think is 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 uh, the evil of this world? Your suffering for his sake. Do you think he's? He thinks that's good. He he can glory in that. It's not saying that that he desires that that you be in pain, physical pain and such like that. But but it's it's knowing the um the the the, the glory that it's going to produce instead of the vain glory. We ourselves are going to go through pain and suffering and tribulation on a daily basis anyway. But the sufferings of Christ concerns the things that concern the Lord Jesus Christ's sake. And notice verse, uh, the rest of it, and for the love of the Spirit. That's for the love of his living word of God, the, the love of the living word. That, that, you, that you love the word enough where you're going to allow it to work effectually within you. That you strive together with me. Notice he wants that like-mindedness. He wants that same like-mindedness. And that is that they have the same mind. That, that's what that... Paul, Paul wouldn't ask the Corinthians and Galatians <laughs> this, this right here. Of course he wouldn't. He'd never even ask the Galatians or the first Corinthians to even pray for him. You, you won't find it. Look at verse 31. That I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service, which I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted for of the saints. And we again covered this when he's saying um, uh, that you know the prayer that he may be delivered from them that do not believe. Remember, Paul knew he was going to come onto the saints. He's not saying, "Hey, can you pray for me that I make it out of Jerusalem?" He knows. He says, "I am sure that when I come onto you." In, in verse twenty-nine. So, but that what he's asking, he's saying that. The ones that don't believe that he just go he he goes on to the next. He be delivered from them, goes on to the next there. That to some that do believe, to ones that do believe. And notice that he says, and that my service which I have for them at Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints, that it be may be acceptable. They're gonna accept it, but that it be accepted in love of those saints that they be well pleased with it as well. Look at verse 32, that I may come unto you with joy 
by the will of God and may be with you refreshed. And, and again, he's asking this in prayer that that they that he may come unto them with joy by the will of God. And again, he's not saying, can you pray that I come unto you? Maybe God will make it where I won't, where I will come unto you. And, he, and if anything tries to get in the way, he's going to put his hand between it. You remember all the suffering Paul endured, he said. And what he wants, he's saying, he wants their, their understanding to be according to Paul's understanding, which is also according to the will of God. That's what he's saying with joy by the will of God. And look at verse uh, 33. Uh, now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. And we've looked at the God of peace. We looked at that there when Paul says, now the God of peace be with you all. And how Paul is uh, saying um, the God of peace, you're going to need the God of peace if you are if you are being afflicted and going through those sufferings of Christ and you are going through the tribulations and all those things there, you wanna, you're going to need to know him as the God of all peace, the God of all hope, the God of all comfort, as we see over there in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, that that's where that salvation comes from those things where you're going to need him as the God of all peace. You're going to need him, the God of hope and the God of, uh, of comfort. And those things are, 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 are right here in um, Romans chapter 15 about him being the God of these things there. So that's what, and we're looking at that there. Um, Paul is, 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 is explaining to these saints here that they ought to be of the same mind and that they ought to know the things that are spiritual, that they ought to know the things that are carnal. They ought to know the things which pertain to God. And we ought to know those things too, because we can't go, we can't move on to Romans chapter 16 without understanding the things that pertain to God. Because when Paul, all Paul's going to do when he goes in Romans 16 is talk about co-laborers and fellow and people that's suffering. These, all these things he's going to make mention all face persecution. They all are facing sufferings and, and, and death. That's why most that's why most of them are in Rome. And 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 not that they're just fleeing so they can just won't won't be killed and live a, live out a good life. They're they're still ministering. They're, they're, they're going elsewhere, but they're still administering the doctrine. They're still he calls them fellow laborers, co uh uh, helpers and all these different other things, they are laboring in the ministry. They are of the same mind. They are, of course, like-minded, but they know the spiritual things. But if we take in our mind the carnal things, when we get to Romans 16, we're going to say, wow, <laughs> Paul says, who have for my life laid down their own necks, to whom I only give thanks, but also to all the churches, I don't know if I can go that far. You know, I, 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 there's other things I value, and I mean, I'm not ready for that yet. You know, I mean, just not ready right now to to uh, go to that extreme. I don't see anything wrong with it, but I just, I don't think I'm ready to go to that extreme yet. And that's what we see people do. People say, well, maybe I'll just have to get my life together, and then, then I'll come to understand that. Well, these saints didn't think that. These saints knew and understood what life they lived. They understood and knew that 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 their uh, what was spiritual, the spiritual things versus the carnal things. They knew the carnal things were the things that the same Romans were doing, that the same Romans were involved with. They were involved with a a, a, a god, a, a small case god worship, idol worship. We'll just say that there. In their area, they valued their uh, the, the land in so much they wanted to make the whole world a Roman Empire so they truly knew about that but you don't see you don't see the uh, the Romans right you don't see the, the Saints writing back about that Paul doesn't even address them about any type of thing like that at all but what we're gonna do is get ready to go to the Q&A and um, Star six one will get you into the queue. Star six one will get you to the queue, and um, 
again, next week we're going to be starting, we're going to be picking, we're going to be starting, uh, beginning the Romans chapter 16, uh, probably do an intro, probably do an intro to that. Um, you know, I'd stop doing the intro situation. I said, well, I just, uh, lesson one is the intro, but we'll see. I'll weigh that out and see, see which way we, we go in that. But you have, we have to have that spiritual mind to understand what is spiritual. What are the things that pertain to God? What are the things that pertain to this world? What are the things that pertain to Satan and what he's after? What, what he loves, what, what he says is the good of this world. And remember, he's going to do something where it's going to look like a, it's going to look like, a, it's going to be a counterfeit. It's going to look like the same. You see over in the book of Revelations, he's doing the exact same things that you see uh, that, that God is going to be uh, uh, doing. About the whole mark of the beast, where is it? it's going to be in the foreheads. You remember what it says about uh, God is going to put his, uh, his name going to be written on their foreheads? And, and about the fire coming down from the sky and the water coming out of the mouth of the beast and all that, that's the same things that, that, that the, the two prophets that, that's going to be doing. And not literally in that, but that's things that, that they did uh, in that, you know, eight uh, times past there. But Satan's going to be doing things that is going to be counterfeiting. And it's going to be things to stir your heart. It's going to be things to get your heart to fall in love with it. And remember, we've seen all those, the ones weeping and wailing, that old great Babylon had fallen. And, and they, they were... And because they fell in love with this world. And as I said before, with the studies I did on the word of God and the word of man versus the word of man and the attributes of the man and woman, we went over that issue about all those counterfeit things that this world gets you, does to make you fall in love. It, 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 it gets your, it attacks your senses. It attacks the senses that we have, what we see what we hear, what the taste, the feel, all the, everything that, that all our senses is being, um, being catered to. You, you, you know it yourself. And we want all those things. If you didn't get that study, uh, please, I advise you to go get it because as I said before, the different tastes with, with the taste, you have so many different things that are uh, all multiple flavors. Within the past five years, things have gotten, um, more variety for you to love. You don't think so? Just just look around there. What you smell, the things that the different aromas. Uh, you, you go buy some Lysol now. It used to be one one flavor. Now you got all different kinds and, and different sprays and different incense and all this stuff. Other stuff that's ramped up versus what it was five years ago. And what you see, everything is more comfortable, as I said before, and all all that thing to the touch and everything. But uh, I'm going to uh, call it here. Three, three, six, six. You're in the queue. Hello. Hey, how you doing, there, sister? Yes, yes. I'm still following up with you on this, and I like how you did the recap on fifteen. How we can't go to sixteen until we get the foundation of fifteen. Right. And about the poor saints in Jerusalem, where it's a foundation with nothing physical, all spiritual. Right. And that's how God sees us in faith and spiritual, not physical. And how the counterfeit, uh, that's of Satan. And you have to know from the counterfeit of the real. So mm -hmm. these studies that have I been with you throughout this teaching is just expiring. Uh, the learning of the coming from the milk to the meat. And uh, it's just so that I have learned and trying to get it into me so I can share this extraordinary doctrine and teaching with others. And I just appreciate it and uh, look forward to go to 16. Mm -hmm. I believe you get, we get 15 down. Right. You know, and we're, we're serving in the thank of the Lord. And that's what we are down here for him. And everything is spiritual. I remind them that everything is teaching is spiritual. Yeah. Uh, but you know, God is the spirit of 
and we worship God in the spirit. You know, it's not nothing fleshly. So anything we see is eyes like this. We see his temple. That's his, uh, 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 not of God. It's mm-hmm. eternal. The things that we don't see. Right. The things that I they say that I'm following up with it. I ain't going to do that unless uh, I go on to be with the Lord. Right. I'm still saying I'm uh, doing these studies so I can stand fast for the Lord and be glad to be today. I appreciate you. Thank you, sister. I, I appreciate you as well. Appreciate you as well. Thank you very much. All <laughs> glory to God. Oh, yeah. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Yeah, and um, that's the uh, uh, that that ought to be that ought to be the the uh, our thinking. Our thinking ought to ought to, we ought to be able to discern what what is spiritual and what's not spiritual. And as I said before, the um, the Bible pastor teachers that 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 do not and, and even the, the saints themselves that cannot discern the the spiritual things, they're not going to be able to understand fully what is taking place in in, in Romans sixteen because. Paul knew that if these current that these uh, Romans did not understand what he was explaining, they wouldn't they wouldn't go on. Uh, he, he couldn't commend them onto Phoebe, as he says, I, in verse six, uh, chapter sixteen, verse one. I commend you onto Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of Christ, which is a servant of the church, which is at Chichia, that you receive her in the Lord as becometh saints and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she have of uh she have need of you because they're going to assume if you have a carnal mind you're going to say well wait a minute where is she going to stay at or what is she going to do you know you're not going to be thinking selflessly and you're going to think her business is not going to be the the ministry the the, the actual spiritual things you're going to assume that it's going to be of a carnal nature, that she just get a little R&R, and maybe you're going to take her around and show her the sights and, and all those things that don't pertain to God. You, you're, going to, you're, going to, you're going to assume that that her, her business there should be that she just take it easy, just relax. Don't go over there because you could be persecuted unto death. You know they don't like Christians over there, you know. That's, that would be a carnal-minded way of thinking. But Paul knew that these saints understood that. He knew that that's why he could call them, uh, say unto them, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. That's what it's about. That's having the mind of Christ. That's, as you see in verse 5, uh, like being like-minded. In verse 6, uh, like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, and that you may have one mind and one mouth glorify God. That's the mind of Christ. That's the mind we ought to have, the, the ones that are strong in the faith. That's what's being spoken of. But, again, we'll, we're going to get to that. Um, we'll, we'll get to that later on, and we'll get to that um, more next time. And um, we'll get more into, again, the labor and the co-laboring in, in chapter 16, um, but we'll also come to understand, I hope, we'll, 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 we'll come to understand what it means to, um, to All participants have, a, have, a, session is over. have a mind, uh, the spiritual mind there that Paul is operating upon there. We'll hopefully, we could say, come to understand that. But I want to thank everyone for uh, watching.